Hello and welcome back to Unmasking Our Leaders by Michael Cockrell. This is episode two of Awesome Audiobooks. Chapter four, The Wiles of Wilson. The new Labour leader, Harold Wilson, sought to present himself as everything that Harold Macmillan was not. Wilson was the Northern Grammar School boy who had made it to Oxford on his own merits. Macmillan was Eton educated and married to a Duke's daughter. Wilson suggested that his own family had been so poor that he had to walk bare feet to school. Macmillan responded, if he was barefoot as a boy, it was because even then he was too big for his boots. In fact, Wilson was the son of a chemist and a teacher and always had shoes. He had become a cabinet minister under Attlee at the age of 31 and grew a moustache just to look older. He had a great talent for equivocation and manoeuvring, which he used to gain the leadership and hold the party together. Mr Wilson had a nimble mind, said Macmillan, sometimes a revolutionary driving the tumbril sometimes affecting the part of moderate statesmanship. Wilson said that Tories like Macmillan and his even more aristocratic successor, Lord Home, who renounced his peerage to become Prime Minister as plain Sir Alec Douglas Home, felt they were born to rule. So Wilson told me they had little or no understanding of the contemporary world and the lives of ordinary people. Instead, he said, Labour will create a society in which brains will take precedence over blue blood. Wilson sought to play up a modern, classless man of the people image with a well-publicised love of H.B. Source and a carefully preserved Yorkshire accent. He kept the expensive cigars he smoked in a private away from the cameras. And he sought to personify the meritocratic future he envisaged for the country, saying you need men with fire in their bellies and humanity in their hearts to create a dynamic, expanding, confident, and above all, purpose New Britain. In the 1964 election, Wilson just scraped home, managing to turn the Tories' 100-seat majority into a Labour lead of just five. Asked how he felt on becoming Prime Minister, he replied, Quite frankly, I feel like a drink. The new PM aimed to use two American presidents as his role models. Like President Franklin Roosevelt, he planned to have fireside chats, delivering fortnightly reports to the public, direct to camera. His second presidential template was John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Age 48, Wilson was the youngest PM of the century up till then and he sought to project himself as the British JFK. He acquired video recordings of President Kennedy's White House press conferences and studied them closely to seeking to replicate JFK's charismatic style. What we want, said Wilson on television, is what President Kennedy had after years of stagnation in America. A hundred days of dynamic action. His political secretary, Marcia Williams, later Baroness Falkender, became his image maker in chief. She virtually never gave interviews, but she told me, We realised, as you were broadcasting into people's homes, you couldn't be some stiff remote figure. You had to be a relaxed figure that people could identify with. To stop Harold gesturing to camera with his fists clenched, which looked rather threatening, we gave him a pipe to smoke during TV interviews. And he would put up his left hand on his cheek, which showed up his wedding ring. It was Harold, the family man, and a subtle contrast with Ted Heath when he became Tory leader, who was of course a bachelor. Television had one great advantage for the Labour Party, Wilson told me. Most of the press were against us and if the right-wing press were tempted to say about me, 
This is a terrible man. He looks like an ogre. His voice is terrible. Then you go on TV and people say, oh, look, he's an ordinary chap like the rest of us. But Wilson was far from an ordinary chap. He was a complex self-creation. The long-serving Labour MP, Gerald Kaufman, who was Wilson's parliamentary press officer in Downing Street, from 1965 to 1970 told me, Harold is the only man I knew who deliberately acquired a sense of humour. I remember when I first knew him in 1948. I was chair of the Oxford University Labour Club, and I have to say it, he was an extraordinary boring speaker. And then suddenly he decided to have a sense of humour. He turned himself into a politician who could make very amusing, sharp, witty cracks. He just worked on it, and he did the same with television. Harold was the first Prime Minister to realise that on television you don't have to speak in sentences with a subject, verb and object. Object. He took great care to use language that was clear, direct and uncomplicated. From the moment he walked into number 10, Wilson was determined to do everything he could to ensure that when he called a snap election he would significantly enlarge his minuscule commons majority. Week by week, he would announce a new plan, initiative or mission. Harold is just moving from emergency to emergency, picking up bright ideas as he goes along. A leading member of his kitchen cabinet, the housing minister Dick Crossman noted in his diary. He jumps from position to position, always brilliantly energetic and opportunistic, always moving in zigzags. His plan for fortnightly fireside chats was turned down by the broadcasters. Instead, for his first 18 months in office, Wilson was ever eager to be interviewed on the BBC and ITV current affairs programmes. Harold didn't go to the TV studios to answer the questions, Gerald Kaufman told me. The questions were an irrelevance. He went there to say something. He decided the message he wanted to communicate. And then, regardless of the questions that were put to him, he said what he meant to say. But to Wilson's chagrin, TV interviews were becoming much tougher than the traditionally kid-gloved BBC men. Leading the pack was Robin Day, a former barrister who wore a bow tie and what one comedian called cruel glasses. The forensic day would not let Wilson get away with not answering the question. Having started with a marvellous honeymoon in the media by 1966, the Prime Minister was becoming convinced that the broadcasters were joining the press in being biased against him. The BBC's Director General Hugh Carleton Green told me, after 13 years in opposition, Labour leaders had become very close to the BBC. Harold Wilson thought he had money in the bank with us, but when he came to cash his cheque it bounced. The PM called for a snap election for March 1966. Eighteen months earlier, as opposition leader Wilson had made great play of challenging the then Prime Minister Sir Alec Douglas home to, live, to a live head-to-head -head TV election debate. But Sir Alec said, I'm not particularly attracted by confrontations of personality. If we are not careful, you'll get a short, you'll get a sort of top of the pops contest. And you would then get the best actor as leader of the country. And the actor would be prompted by a scriptwriter. He turned down the flat invitation to appear in a debate. But the Conservatives now had a new leader, a grammar school boy from an unprivileged background like Wilson. Ted Heath was chosen, partly because Tory MPs believed he would be a match for Wilson on TV. There was no love lost between the two men. Heath told me, I am sick to death with people who can talk about political life in terms of image and imagery. I was against gimmicks. I was against all the cosy pipe-smoking and evading every issue. Mr Wilson 
always seemed to be concerned with some improvisatory device to tide him over, and in that he was supreme at getting the press on his side. In the 1966 election, it was Heath who challenged Wilson to a live TV debate. The PM seemed to accept the challenge publicly, but behind the scenes it was rather different. We felt that a confrontation on TV would have given Heath an advantage, Marcia Williams told me. Heath was trying to make his leadership stick. Harold was by then a very well-known figure. It would have given Heath a lot of exposure as a potential Prime Minister in setting that he wanted. Harold's office would have rubbed off on Heath. We decided that Harold was not going to appear on equal terms with him. The problem was that tactically Wilson wanted neither to appear with Heath nor for it to look publicly as if he were refusing to do so. With a piece of characteristically fancy footwork, Wilson managed to stymie the whole project by accusing the BBC, which had enthusiastically promoted the idea of the debate, of supporting the Tories. Instead, Wilson wanted to conduct a low-key campaign. The image would be of a Prime Minister and his government resolutely tackling the problems they had been bequeathed with calm, confidence and efficiency. In two of Labour's five election broadcasts, the Prime Minister spoke reassuringly to the camera from behind an imposing desk. Wilson later told the Irish Prime Minister, Sean Lee Mass, about the image he had wanted to project. Harold Wilson said that a political leader should try to look particularly on television like a family doctor, Lee Mass told me. He should come over as a family doctor who inspires trust by his appearance as well as by his soothing words, and whose advice is welcome. It worked. Dr Wilson won a majority of nearly 100. But, as it happens with landslides, things quickly went belly up. Dick Crossman claimed that within four months of his famous victory, Wilson had gone from catastrophe to catastrophe and suffered the most dramatic decline of any modern Prime Minister. The economy was on the slide, the trade unions were out of control, and the markets believed the pound would crash. From the moment he had stepped into number 10, Wilson had pledged to protect the value of sterling. He was only too well aware that the previous Labour governments had failed to do so. But in November 1967, Wilson reluctantly gave up the unequal struggle and announced he was devaluating the pound by 14%. He appeared on television for a special broadcast to the nation. But Wilson went too far. He sought to play down the significance of devaluation and even suggested it was a part of his own cunning plan. In the most notorious passage of the broadcast, he said, from now on the pound is worth 14% less in terms of other currencies. This does not mean that the pound here in Britain in your pocket or purse or bank has been devalued. In his self-proclaimed role of economics tutor to the populace, the PM was trying to tell people that if they were went into the banks or shops, the next day they would still get 20 shillings for every pound they had. But it looked as though he was effectively trying to deny that devaluation had happened. The broadcast was met with rage across the country. As Wilson's closest adviser, Marcia Williams, stood loyally by him. She told me it would have been unnerving for the people to see their Prime Minister appearing full of woe and foreboding, rather than reassuring them and giving them a reason to hope. The leader had to rally the troops. The fact was that devaluation represented a crushing political defeat for Wilson, he was well aware that he had broken his private axiom that King Canuet would have done better if the tide was going out. By attempting to present devaluation as a pan panacea and implying that he had really favoured it all along, the PM had shot a large hole in his own foot. All op oppositions 
seek to prove that governments cannot be trusted and the Tories had spent nearly five years seeking to demolish Wilson's homespun credibility on television. Now his own broadcast had done it for them. It became open season on the Prime Minister. On a topical BBC comedy programme, there was a bitter joke. You know how you can always tell someone is lying. There are always unconscious bits of body language that give him away every time he tells a whopper. It might be a nervous tick near his eye, or his hand may go up to his face, or a vein in his neck may stand out. But what's the tell-tale body language when Harold Wilson is lying? When you see his lips move. The PM threatened to sue, and the BBC sent him a letter of apology. Wilson was widely seen as having devalued himself, and his carefully crafted image as a trusted family doctor had fragmented. After the evaluation, Marcia Williams told me, we had three years of public meetings where Harold had been heckled badly, eggs had been thrown as well as tomatoes and flour. He used to come home looking absolutely awful, so we had these bad images on television, and we were determined to counter them. When Wilson called the 1970 general election, he appeared on BBC's television election forum, which had solicited questions from viewers. Robin Day began the programme by saying, This question represents an angry theme running through many of these cards. In view of your past record of lies and broken promises, do you really expect the electorate to place any reliance on your word? Wilson calmly turned the question round to say that he hoped to have the opportunity of nailing the lies that had been told about him for the past six years. But while he sounded cool, he looked hot and bothered. The next day, the Daily Telegraph headlined the Prime Minister's perspiration. His press secretary, Joe Haynes, suspected BBC dirty tricks. He told me, The studio was intolerably hot that day, and almost as soon as Harold went on, the sweat was running down his face. He looked on television as if he was wriggling under intensely hostile questioning, and it was made much worse when the floor manager of the BBC apologised and said that when he, Mr Heath had been in the previous day, it had been so cold that she had had to send out for a cardigan. Hence, conspiracy theory. In contrast to Wilson, the Tory slogan for their leader was Ted Heath, a man to trust. When the votes were counted, Wilson's landslide majority was wiped out, and the Tories returned to power with a narrow lead. Chapter 5. On the Road The year 1970 was quite a packed one for me. I was directing films at home and abroad for the nightly programme 24 Hours on BBC. When filming I nearly became a casualty of war in Africa and then in the Middle East. I also made films about the BBC general election and played cricket for the MCC. And it was the year I married a BBC colleague, Anne Faber, who was Macmillan's granddaughter and we had our first child. At the start of the year I was sent to Nigeria, Africa's largest country by population, where the two and a half year civil war was coming to an end. Even by the standards of such conflicts, the war was an essentially and especially brutal affair. It had been triggered by oil-rich eastern Nigeria seceding and declaring itself the independent republic of Biafra. The federal government, with its massively superior firepower, invaded the rebel state and fighting continued for more than two years, with the rebels accusing the invaders of deploying starvation and genocide as weapons of war. As the conflict was in its last throes, the world press descended on Lagos. Working as a film director, I was there with the renowned reporter Tom Mangold. We knew it was going to be a hard slog, partly because the Nigerian government hated the BBC, or what it called biased reporting, and what we called refusing to swallow the increasingly shrill propaganda claims and counterclaims on both sides. When we arrived, the federal government had imposed a ban on journalists travelling out of Lagos to what was left of the self-proclaimed Bafran 
Republic. <clears throat> there was a surreal moment when the Nigerian Red Cross called a press conference. For hundreds of journalists and camera crews, the organization's head took to the platform and announced, the Nigerian Red Cross has called this conference to say that the Nigerian Red Cross has nothing to say to the press at this time. He then left the room, refusing to take questions. The cream of the media were reduced to interviewing each other. We were getting nowhere, and I approached the chief press officer of the Ministry of Information, Sam Eppel. He wore dark glasses and a menacing mien. I said, I'm from the BBC, and I wonder if you could help me. We're finding it very difficult to film here or get any government ministers to speak to us. He replied, it will do the BBC good to eat some of its own poison for a change, and he walked off. Despite that, we did manage to make a film about life in post-war Lagos, and we had a coup when we exclusively secured film of the commanding officers of each side signing a peace treaty together in secret. Their dialogue was matchless. The government men said, the government man said to his opposite number, Hello, old boy. Haven't seen you since Sandhurst. How are things going? His biofren counterpart was equally plummy. It's been a bit of an up and down ride, but mustn't grumble. We sent the film back to London where it led to the BBC News. But the big question was, what had happened to the leader of secession, the proclaimed first president of Bifra, the charismatic General Imika Ojuku? Through his TV interviews, he had become quite a well-known and sympathetic figure in Britain. We had a tip-off that General Ujuku had fled the country and been given sanctuary by the nearby former French colony, Ivory Coast, which was one of only five countries that had recognised Biafra. We flew to the capital, Abidjan, and went to see the Biafran ambassador who denied all knowledge of Ujuku's whereabouts. Tom and I then split up and arranged to meet later. I went to film at a camp for refugees from war-torn Biafra. They were less than pleased by our presence and came out en masse and grabbed us. The police arrived, we were arrested, taken to jail and accused of being Nigerian spies. There, we had to hand over all our belongings, including the TV camera, and were made to strip to our underpants. We were put into a tiny cell which contained a pail for ablutions, a hapless Ivorian, also in his pants, apparently being held for beating his wife. A tough-looking police officer then came in and demanded, Où est le quatre me? Where is the fourth one of you? It meant they must have been following us before we split up. I said I would take them to the cafe, where I was due to be meeting Tom. Tom wasn't there, so we went to our hotel, and as we were in the lobby, I saw a white man in a business suit. I separated myself from my police escort. And asked the man if he would let the British ambassador know that four journalists from the BBC had been arrested. He turned out to be South African and said in a thick African's accent I am having nothing to do with this and walked off. I then saw another besuited white man and asked him too if he would inform the British Embassy of our arrest. He said I am from the Embassy. At that stage my police escort had had enough and ignoring the British diplomat they manhandled me out of the hotel and back in their car. I remember thinking as I was being driven back to the prison through some of the roughest parts of town that this was the kind of place where I might easily be beaten up and dumped or worse. But we reached the prison and I was put back in the cell in my underpants. Shortly afterwards Tom was brought in to join us. They said to him De chalibes vous get undressed. He went up greatly in my estimation when he summoned his hazy French and said, Non, j'ai refusé absolument de me de cheva. They repeated the instruction in a much more threatening tone. Again, Tom refused, saying, 
Pourquoi mi déchir là-bas? C'est ici un pays civilisé? Why should I undress? This is a civilized country. The copper responded, In civilisé was one of the most chilling monosyllables I've ever heard. Tom stripped off. So, there we were in the cell. Tom, me and the cameraman and the sound recorder all stripped to our underpants. Tom broke the silence when he looked round the cell and said, That's the last time I come on a Clarkson's package holiday. We all laughed to keep our spirits up. Gallows humour in the manner of plucky British prisoners of war. The guards came to the barred window of the jail and told us to shut up or else. After a few more hours in the cell, we suddenly heard a very English voice echoing down the corridor. Is the BBC team still here? Can you answer me if you are? We yelled ourselves hoarse. The voice turned out to be that of the resident MI6 officer in the British Embassy. He was allowed to take charge of us and said that the Embassy had reached a deal that we'd be released from jail and kicked out of the country as personae non grati. Later over celebration drinks at the Embassy, our man in Abidjan told me it was very lucky that I bumped into one of his colleagues in the hotel lobby. Otherwise, he said, there would have been nothing to stop the Ivory Coast government denying all knowledge of us and keeping us in Kyomundico in jail for months. And then he said we would have, he said we would be produced and put on a show trial as spies and or white mercenaries, both of which malfeasances carried very heavy penalties. Instead, we flew out of Abidjan on the first plane to Paris, where the BBC had laid on a private plane to take us home. A few months later, I was filming another civil war with another battle-hardened reporter, the late David Lomax. We were in Amman, the capital of Jordan, where the army was on the brink of war with Palestinian guerrilla troops based in the country. In what had been in what became known as Black September, one radical group had hijacked three Western Airline jets with over three hundred and fifty passengers abroad and landed them in the Jordanian desert. After decanting the passengers, the hijackers dramatically blew up the three planes in front of the international press. We managed to film one group of the guerrilla fighters, known as the Fedayin, training in a secret encampment using live ammunition. And we interviewed their leader, who said their main aim was to get rid of what he called the fascist leader of Jordan, King Hussein. In the previous months, the king had escaped three assassination attempts by the Fedayin. He felt that Yasser al-Frat's Palestinian Liberation Organization which had moved its headquarters to Jordan following the loss of the West Bank to Israel, was acting as a state within a state. Some 70% of Jordan's population was Palestinian, two million, of them, two million of them in refugee camps. And as we discovered when we filmed in much of Amen, the Fedayin ruled the streets and were a law unto themselves. King Hussein was coming under huge pressure from his army, to act against the guerrilla groups or face a military coup. We learned that when Hussein went to inspect a crack tank squad, he saw that instead of flying Jordanian pennants, they were flying black braziers. The king asked what was meant by that and the reply was, if you treat us like women, we will behave like women. While the rest of the 250 strong international press corps were staying at a modern skyscraper hotel above the city. We were staying at a back street hotel below, close to Fedayin strongholds. On the 17th of September, King Hussein ordered tanks into Amen, and the army launched a full-scale attack on Palestinian guerrillas across the country. The airport and the country's borders were sealed, and all telecommunication lines were closed down. I was woken at dawn by the sound of heavy shelling and gunfire. 
with the explosions and collapsing buildings worryingly close, we tried to find somewhere to shelter in the hotel. We discovered it didn't have a basement, but there was a large communal bathroom in the middle of the ground floor protected by two sets of walls. Also on the search for shelter were six other hotel guests, two American from the TWA airline, who had arrived to fly their hijacked plane home, only to see it blown up. A Bolivian housing expert, a French male nurse and two Russian documentary makers who had come to make a film about Petra, the famous rose-red city, half as old as time. As a mini UN, we shared out the sleeping spaces on the floor of the bathroom. David's was between the bidet and the loo, mine between the loo and the bath. We brought down pillows from our rooms. This was where we would try to sleep. For the next week, with the power and water cut off, each day the army poured mortar shells and heavy artillery into the Fedayin strongholds close to the hotel. One of the worst moments was when we realised that 15 Fedayin had taken over the next door house, armed with Kalashnikovs. Every burst of fire from them would attract shells from the army up the hill above, and it seemed only a matter of time before they would be a direct hit on our hotel. I remember trying to keep the spirits up of my bathroom companions by acting insuant. I'll say this about you, Michael, said the shrewd David Lomax. You were just as scared as the rest of us. He wasn't wrong. I remember thinking as I lay in my allotted bathroom space, that it would be an inglorious way to die as the incidental casualty of other people's combat. Without any contact with the outside world, we were encouraged to hear on our tran transitor radio that the British ambassador to Jordan hoped we were safe. At that moment, a huge shell came crashing into the hotel Happily, it didn't reach the bathroom. Some days later, we suddenly heard the sound of a tracked vehicle coming down the hill. It turned out to be the Jordanian army, and they stopped outside the hotel to pick us up. David and I went upstairs quickly to pack some clothes and a portable typewriter, and the others waiting for us in the tank felt they were sitting ducks and shouted at us when we clambered in. We tundled up the hill to the Intercontinental Hotel, where all the other journalists were staying. We saw a scene of devastation, with scarcely a building left intact. The two Russians had declined to come with us. A day later we learned that one of them had put his head out the window of his room and been shot dead by a Fedayin. As I commiserated with his colleague, I asked why they hadn't come in the tank with us. He replied, I wanted to come, but Boris refused to leave his TV camera kit behind. But did it belong to him? I asked. He said no. It was the property of the Moscow Central documentary films. We had a much clearer view of the continuing fighting from the sixth floor of the Intercontinental. We could see whole houses disappearing as Jordanian army shells smashed into the residential district opposite. There were piles of debris and twisted metal wherever we looked. Columns of thick, oily smoke belched out from various targets all over the suburbs. What was worse were the plumes of white smoke from shellfire rising from the Palestinian refugee camps, where thousands of people were living in tin shacks. Among the journalists at the Intercontinental was the celebrated war photographer Don McC McCullen whom I knew. Like the rest of us, he had been confined to the hotel by the army. One evening he said to me, come upstairs and watch the fireworks. We went up to the roof of the hotel and his fireworks consisted of tracers followed by shells and rockets and journalists shouting outgoing and occasionally incoming. A one moment a missile flew straight at us. It smashed into the back wall, leaving McCullen and me spread eagled on the roof where we had died for cover. I noticed that Don thought it was all great fun. I thanked him for the fireworks party and left. 
After the army and the PLO signed a ceasefire, we eventually made it to the airport, where a Red Cross plane was to fly us out to Beirut. There was an airport sign which said, Thank you, come again. We cheered. When I arrived at Beirut, I was last able to talk to my wife, who was six months pregnant with our first child. I said I hoped she hadn't been too worried. She replied that she had tried to keep her spirits up, but the worst moment was when her mother said to her, Oh God, I can't bear it. It's like the First World War. Widowed before you've had the child. Very comforting. David Lomax managed to make it back to London in time for that night's transmission and was in the 24-hour studio with one of the first eyewitness accounts of the Black September Civil War. None of the journalists who had been incarcerated in, inter in the Intercontinental Hotel had managed to escape its confines and do any first-hand reporting. Instead, they had agreed that a different one of them each day would write a poor disp dispatch in the hope the telex machine would start to work. It made for a good cartoon in the London Evening Standard, which depicted many idle journalists in the hotel and an editorial figure with an eye shade, carrying a piece of paper saying, Here's a pulled dispatch. You are all fired. Happily, the BBC gave us a hardship bonus instead, and on Christmas Eve 1970, our first child was safely born. It had been quite a year. Thanks, guys. That is the end of Unmasking Our Leaders, episode two. Um, and if you enjoyed, please give it a like and subscribe for more. Goodbye.